Welcome to Interludes with Chris McKenzie. And it is my great joy and pleasure to welcome back to Golden Days Radio Louis Fayanda, actor of stage, screen, TV... Many parts. I know. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely to nice see to be you back. again. Yes. Now we have to continue with your wonderful saga of your life. Uh huh. You were just about, I think, to go overseas the last time. Right. Yeah? Okay. Yes. I leave it to you. Actually, Take it away. Actually, uh, I remember that day. Uh, I, I was put on the Oriana mm-hmm. and uh, Sydney. Sailed out of Sydney and then down to Melbourne home. I'd never been through the Rip before. It was wonderful. Mm-hmm. I mean, Port Phillip. Bay is really an underrated piece of water, Absolutely. but to come in through the rip and see the city is really fabulous experience. And then, of course, we sailed across to Fremantle. But the day we left Fremantle with the band playing on the um, uh, the oh, wharf there and the yeah. streamers, you remember all that? Yes. I don't know they do it anymore. But the band was playing Waltzing Matilda, and I stood on the back of the Oriana, and I stood there for the entire time it took to see Australia disappear over the horizon with this oh. waltzing Matilda just ringing in my ears and thinking when will I ever see it again oh, and yeah. uh, it was quite uh, I think it was another six years I was only supposed to be going over there for two years and uh, so the next time was a tour of the Royal Shakespeare Company going to New Zealand so I popped back home anyway we went across to London with the one day of the year which was the Australian play I, I went to do yes. with Ron Hadrick and Patricia Connolly and uh, Reg Lai a lovely actress from Western Australia called Nita Panel and um, we arrived in London of course it was great excitement uh, the Oriana was a fantastic boat and one was seeing foreign parts for the first time mm-hmm. I think the first stop was Colombo which was oh. very exciting yes you know. And um, we had uh, lunch at the Gore Face Hotel. I think That's it was, right. Is that right, Gore Face? Yes. Gore Fachi or something? Gore, Gore Face. Face. Gore yes. Face Hotel. Yes. And uh, that was splendid. And we went up to Candy, of course, you know, and um, uh, Ceylon in those days, wasn't yes. it? Yes. And then the next stop was Aden, which was even more exciting. Oh, much those more. Kites <laughs> flying around, you know, and stops there anymore, and duty free things. So I had my first experience of bartering for a camera and a projector and things like that, and did rather well. <laughs> And then the next stop was um, uh, Portside. Um, Suez, Suez first. Yes. Got off and went overland to mm. Cairo. Oh, did you? And then drove up and passed uh, the Oriana in the um, canal, and got on at uh, Port Said. Oh, the, were you on the back of a camel? Uh, no, I wasn't. Mm. But I, there was a man on board. Um, uh, now his name was Roland Hill, I think, and he was a travel agent. Mm-hmm. And we'd had a lot of mates and. Uh, uh, girlfriends and things on the boat, you know. And he just said, uh, would you like to come to Cairo? I have a car. So we all piled in the car and drove this long distance to Cairo. And he had a friend there who was an archaeologist. And we wanted to go to the Cairo Museum, of yep. course. Um, and the archaeologist said, no, I will take you to the pyramids first. So we went to the pyramids and he hadn't been out there for some time. And all the chaps there, the guards and so forth, greeted him. And we were taken into the pyramid and we were in the great pyramid by ourselves, you know, the tourists hadn't got in or anything. It was oh, a wow. lovely experience. And of course, the same thing happened when we went to the Cairo Museum. The uh, president of Portugal was visiting, and the museum was closed for that day, which was awful. <laughs> and uh, then um, once again, someone spotted him, and we were taken into Tutankhamun's treasure chamber upstairs, mm-hmm. and we were in there totally. Oh, how marvelous. Alone, you know. Yeah. And the lovely thing was the, uh, about two weeks ago, I was at the Baldwin Cinema uh, seeing Amélie, which oh, I loved, yes. and I came out of the cinema and I saw this lady there. Now, what is it? It's uh, 1961. And this lady, and I went past her, and then I backtracked, and I said, were you on the Oriana with me? And she said, yes. And I said, well, I'm Lewis. <laughs> and there was 40 years about that. Yeah, yeah. She was looking lovely, too. Wonderful. And she said, this is my son, who was about six foot seven. You yes. Know. And uh, it was incredible. Absolutely. How oh, exciting. It was such fun. Yes, it was. Such fun. Yeah, I came out by sea, and I'm, I always think how sad it is that so many people can't do that anymore. Yeah. Well, I believe that you can go on some of these tankers and things. They like to have passengers there, mm-hmm. and these ships are quite expensive. But I believe it's a great... Leo McKern always did that. Mm-hmm. He hated flying. Oh, right. And Leo only flew 
after his Peter Finch hated flying too. Peter wouldn't go on uh, a plane. But Leo flew back from Australia when he was doing that uh, play of um, Patrick Edgeworth about Boswell. Oh, yes. Um, Leo flew back because he hadn't done his VAT, the GST. Uh oh. And, uh, you know, <coughs> rather strange system over there because um, uh, I think that the money GST goes to uh, not the inland revenue, it goes to customs and excise. Ah. And they have police powers. <gasps> right, oh, yes, okay. So don't uh, listen, anyone listening in, I only said that as because don't tell anyone, for God's sake. <laughs> It's a secret. I had a friend of mine lose his house in the country. Really? Yeah. He hadn't paid it and was in Switzerland, and they had the right to go in and sealed it up and uh, put his house on the market, and it was sold. By the time he came back, you couldn't believe it. Good grief. And there's no, because it's customers and excise, there's no, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, <laughs> there's you, no forgiveness, that would you, be for you can't, sure. You can't sue them or whatever or take them to court or whatever. Good grief. We're going to have a bit of music now. All right. Yeah, we're going yes. to listen to Gladys Moncrief and Love Will Find a Way. Magic voice, Gladys Moncrief from Maid of the Mountains. Love will find a way. Wasn't bravo, bravo, something? bravo. Oh, bravo. Yep. Clap, clap. Yes. Or brava, I should have said, of course. Bravo, of course. Brava, <coughs> yes, oh dear. Right. Now, you were you were trundling across the world to go to England, and what? And did, when did you arrive there? You went um, straight into the play? I can't remember. It was 19, uh, September 61, I think. Mm. And we went into rehearsals. We arrived at uh, Waterloo Station and stood on Waterloo Bridge. Mm -hmm. We were greeted by the management, who was Laurie Lister, who was Sir Lawrence's um, uh, manager, mm -hmm. also ran his own company and produced uh, reviews, famous reviews with Joyce Grenfell and mm, right. Max Adrian, people like that. And then we rehearsed in London and we played at the Theatre Royal, Stratford East, which was the great home of Joan Littlewood um, during the 60s, you mm -hmm. know, very important place and I had appeared before I arrived there in The Hostage and The Taste of Honey which had originated at, at oh, that theatre. Oh well done, yes. 
And you used to get off the train every morning and go to the theatre and down the East End, you know, and all these lovely East End ladies were standing there at the door. Here he comes, here he comes. <laughs> Morning, how are you? Where are you from? You going to Jones Theatre, are you? Yeah, right, OK. And they eventually found out I was Australian, so immediately I, I became favourite, you know. Mm. But in those days when those little houses which although we may thought were a bit slummy to look at, they were so neat. The, mm. the, the front doorstep was polished. The windows were like crystal, yes. you know, and little flowers in the, on a doily. And, yeah. the, and oh. there were people with hearts of gold. Yep. And uh, they used, Joan used to invite them to the theatre to see the matinees. And um, Saturday matinees were wonderful because they used to talk to you from the audience. I had a scene where I was about to cry in it, you know, because it was about Anzac Day. Mm. And um, and and then the disaster at the Dardanelles, you know, Gallipoli and so forth, and the reaction of the youth to Anzac Day, saying, "What the hell is it all about? What's it got to do with us?" An interesting play in its time and pretty controversial. But they came in one scene. My father hit me, uh, had to hit me in the thing, you know, and I was close to tears. <laughs> one night I was. Ron hit me so hard, oh, okay. and they'd say, "Oh, don't cry, love. No, don't. No, he's all right. He's a good boy. <laughs> no, he means well, you know." And at first you thought, oh, God, what is all this? But I used to look forward to it because they were... Talk about audience act oh, reaction. I'm they were marvelous. fantastic. Anyway, Joan came down to see us, and um, uh, she was an extraordinary woman and uh, told us all sorts of stories, particularly about Brendan being... Uh, Brendan Bean being violently drunk and not being able to finish the hostage, you know. Oh, dear. She yeah. locked him in the green room for a weekend, and she got... Um, she told me she got a pistol from the props department a bottle of whiskey paper and pencils and said to him <laughs> if by Monday I don't have the second act I'm going to blow your bloody head off she said <laughs> <laughs> and he got so frightened she got she got the finish of the show on Monday morning <laughs> so how long did you how long did that show run it it ran I can't remember I suppose it might have been for a month yeah and then we were going to transfer to the West End. We got pretty good notices. Attlee was there at the first night. Mm -hmm. And people would come out to Stratford, you know. I mean, Princess Margaret used to go out there quite a lot to see the plays. Because it, although it was theatre for a sort of working-class area, it became mm -hmm. very fashionable. Mm -hmm. And it always turns against the original intention, you know. Uh, Boris Karloff was there one day. Uh, you know, it was amazing. Yeah. And... Um, but we couldn't get into the West End because uh, there wasn't a theatre available. Um, a television, a big television strike hit. Um, that went on for six months. So consequently, all the theatres hung on to their plays like mad and uh, actors were taking cuts in salary to stay and work. You know, It was a very yeah. bad time. And, and we nearly... Ron flew back to Australia and they stopped him in Cairo because we nearly went into the... Um, the comedy theatre where my darling Carl Brown was doing Bon Soup mm. which had had very bad notices and then a famous critic called Harold Hobson came out in the Sunday papers and praised it to the ceiling you know uh, to the skies and they were uh, able to stay on and we were still kept out so it was a bit sad mm. So then what happened? Well uh, being with Laurie Lister um, uh, it was auditioned um, and also um Elsie Byer and the connections with the Elizabethan Theatre Trust um, a number of people were invited to come and see us and uh, now let me get this right you see I haven't thought about this for a long time Laurier asked me if I would like to audition for Sir Lawrence because he was going to run the Chichester Festival Theatre this new theatre 18 miles out of London this little town and I said well of course I would and he arranged for me to, to audition for Olivia at the Savile Theatre where he was appearing in a play called Semi-Detached. Most of the knights wanted to do light comedy, mm -hmm. which, of course, most of them weren't very good at it. Ah. They couldn't do the Rex Harrison, Cary Grant, mm. Peter Finch sort of stuff, you yeah. know. But they all wanted to do it. Very elusive thing. It's, a, it's an art of doing everything and yet doing nothing. Yeah. Great skill. Uh, Olivia was doing the silly play. Michael Redgrave was doing another silly play with chewing gum behind his ears. Uh, Alec Guinness <laughs> was doing something where he's playing a woman in it, I think. And it was rather chaotic. And the first time I ever saw Olivia in the flesh was in this play, and he was awful. <laughs> <laughs> he was so awful, I can't tell you. What a come down. Yeah. Anyway, I did the audition on the stage of the Savile Theatre, which no longer exists in um, Shaftesbury Avenue. And... Uh, 
suddenly I was sitting on the stage waiting and this, this man sort of shambled in in this rather bad suit and mm. so forth and then I realised this great hero, the years of waiting, the looking at his books, reading about everything, there he was talking to me as if... This was himself? If, yeah, yeah. Sir Lawrence? Yes. And uh, so I was uh, invited to Chichester and then I got a, a, a contract from HM Tennant which was the big commercial company in the West End run by a man called Hugh, known as Binky Beaumont. Yep. And the directors of his company were Sir John Gilgood and Sir Ralph Richardson and David Edith Evans. And uh, they probably were the most prestigious of all managements in the West End. And they put on new plays. You see, all we do in Australia still now is to reproduce plays from overseas, which have already succeeded. Uh -huh. And they're a commercial management producing playwrights like Terence Rattigan, mm -hmm. new plays, a uh, Christopher Fry. Yeah. I mean, that was a bit of a... Yeah, you know. and he had two companies. He had a non-profit making, making company, which enabled him to do certain risky pieces. Um, so I I joined Tennis. I had the same contract that Richard Burton had. It was very generous. Mm. He had about six young people under his wing. And you were given a basic salary, which meant that you didn't have to starve or anything like mm -hmm. that. And then you would be farmed out. I did a lot of television for Tennis. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the year, if I'd made more than my basic... Um, I think I was on about... 15 quid a week or something if I made more than that you got a check at the end of it wow the difference and then I had a second year mm -hmm. uh, but I certainly earned more money than Richard Burton did in his day so there <laughs> that settled that little yes, question yes I think he was we, on 10 we were worried week. about that he was 10 know? quid a week I think was yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to have to have a little bit more music now, and then we go back. And it's a gentleman called Asta Piazzolla. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I like him. Uh, uh, you know that lady we all admire, Mieta O'Donnell. Yes. And uh, who sadly was killed yes. over a year ago. Mieta's establishment was incredible. You could go and see anything. There was a festival going on there every week, and one night she phoned up and said, uh, I've got a a tango band in here tonight, and I think you might like them. Come in. So I thought, how extraordinary thing. Jealousy, da 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 and yes. all that sort of nonsense. So I went in and saw this Melbourne-based uh, tango orchestra, and I absolutely fell in love with it. I had no idea how complicated and wonderful and like chamber music, you know. Right, well, let's and hear here it. is uh, uh, Vuelvo al Vuelvo Sur. El Sur. Sur.
Vuelve siempre al amor Vuelvo a vos Con mi deseo Con mi temor Quiero al sur Su buena gente Su dignidad Siento el sol como tu cuerpo en la intimidad Vuelvo al sur Llevo el sur Te quiero el sol Te quiero el sur Well, that was absolutely lo beautiful, lovely, interesting, Astor Piazzolla. And, but we d have decided that it's very difficult to do the tango. And yes, <clears throat> I mean, I, I really love it. I love watching it. I'd love to do it. But you see, I'd love dancing anyway, and I can't do it. Although I do appear in musicals, I can get away with comic waltzes. And things oh, like yes, that, yes, yes, yes. But, you know, that tango is... I can send up... Uh, is beyond all things, really. I do a lot of tangos and musicals, I have, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Very good in My Fair Lady in the Rain in Spain at the end, you know, <laughs> clicking those fingers and castanets. I'm sure. I can imagine it. But uh, no, I no, just... Listen, I you're, ju you're earning more than... Um, what was his face name? Richard Burton. Yes. Yes, yes. Mm. And now, now, I mean, at the time, you suppose you didn't think anything of it. I mean, you know, it's just another... No, no, it was just wonderful. And, of course, being with tenants, doors were open to me, and uh, I met some of the most extraordinary people and auditioned. I auditioned for a man called Harold Clerman, who was a great American director and producer. And he was brought over to do a Christopher Fry play with Sean Connery, mm -hmm. playing, um, I think it was called Judith, so what, he would have been Holofernes or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm within, you know, a very short time. Um, I was mixing with a lot of people which I had read about and knew who they were, and I just really couldn't believe. I was very lucky. You were lucky, and you were you were also able to be hugely excited and interested in all that, as yeah. opposed to meeting people you've never heard of. Yeah, and, and of course that that sixties period was unbelievable. Not only was uh, you know, there was no young Albert Finney's and Tom Courtney's and et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And uh, Covent Garden with Callis and Sutherland emerging and oh, tough, Tito eh? Gobby and the ballet world was it was just unbelievable. <sighs> Nuria from Fontaine and Poor baby. And then down at Chichester, <laughs> Olivia with this wonderful theatre, which and consequently because of the success he became the director of the first national theatre of Great Britain, which had taken a hundred years to get. And I was in oh. that. I was invited to be in that. Well, listen, we 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 have scratched the surface, but <laughs> we've, we've we've got a lot more scratching to do. Would you please, 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 on bended knees, come back to Golden Days Radio, do another one? Arise, your wish is granted. Ah, thank you very much. That'll be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to Interludes with Chris McKenzie. Oh,